My name's Bolo Bolo Unifingo. Um, first panel this morning is the true history of, of the bike petition. Our speakers are 19 Nancy Williams, Mr. Ron Coxford, and Mr. Ted Egan. Also with Kalaroi Unifingo and Brewa Monogur and others. So I welcome our first, my old school principal, Ron Coxford. Please welcome him. Thank you. You old, old man, it's true. I'd like to acknowledge the Yongo who are the traditional custodians of this place here at Gukalam, and all the Yongo who are the traditional custodians of all the other places in this country across North Australia. I'd also like to pay respect to the Yongo elders, both past and present, who have cared for and respected the places in this and other areas of North Australia. And I'd also like to say thank you to the Yoto Yindi Foundation for bringing me back to this wonderful place. Fifty years ago, I had a, a great respect for the fellow who's over there now, Ted Egan. And he said to me yesterday that uh, this must be an emotional moment. I didn't feel emotional at that time, but boy, did I feel emotional this morning. In 1963, I was headmaster of what was then the new school. The school we started off with at Yurkala had a sand floor. You can imagine what it was like when we used plasticine and it fell to the floor. Or we, for those who can remember Cuisinaire, we'd lose one of the rods in the sand. I think that the school... Uh, and I was really welcomed by this fellow here on my left on my first day. I wasn't going to say this, but I'll have to say it now. I've started. On my first day, uh, a lad was told to behave himself by my teaching assistant, uh, Dan Bellapur, and I've been given permission to use his name. Um, he remonstrated with this young lad... I thought he was about 10 or 11. And uh, the young fellow was uh, taken outside and the next minute there was a hail of stones that came in for the, through the door. Uh, I didn't know where to look or what to do, being my first day. Fortunately, Dame Bellable took him over and uh, handled the job well. I thought it was a younger Yunapingo. But Gulleroy told me some years ago that he was the one that threw the stones. <laughs> the genesis of the Yerkalabark painting for me began one Saturday afternoon. We'd been on a picnic, both uh, mission staff and Yung or down to Melville Bay. Had a wonderful day and as we drove back and came into the outskirts of the mission area where we had our fences, uh, there was a line of white marker pegs about 750 metres inside our fence. And uh, my immediate thought was, this has been hit, put here by the mining company. They'd uh, done the job on the day whilst we were out. And I was very disturbed and I think that that was one of the epiphanies that I had in my life, at, uh, which was very important in, in understanding land rights. Because I knew that if a mining company did that, they were likely to do anything uh, against uh, the Yolngu people. We reported the situation to the then um, superintendent of it, of the mission, uh, the Reverend Edgar Wells, and uh, not only were we and the mission staff the, uh, upset, so were the Yongo, very upset. And they could see, I think they were aware of uh, 
just how um, what was going to happen to them. Bain Atwood, in his book, Rights for, for Aborigines, tells what uh, occurred at that point and what took place before. It's a good read, and it tells very much um, as he saw the situation with rights. Bain writes that, and I quote here, on the 19th of February, 1963, Edgar Wells' te telegram political leaders, newspapers and political organisations throughout Australia. And this was his telegram, and it's worth, worth quoting. 583 semi-nomads now squeezed by the bauxite land grab into half a square mile. Note that, half a square mile. Original holding, 200 square miles. Impossible to house population in approved homes within the area. Loss of cultivated and grazing lands means we must eat cattle before miners arrive and import basic food crops afterwards. I thought quite an interesting telegram. Now, structure of the mission management at that time, the superintendent had control of the, uh, what was going on in the mission, and uh, Edgar was a man who tended to hold things very close to his chest. And we, on, uh, we other members of the staff didn't know what was going on. We didn't know what he was doing. But the next event for me with regards to the Bark Petition was, it took place only a few days after that coming back from the picnic and noticing the uh, picket line uh, that had been put there. Dame Balibor, my teaching assistant, and my brother, I was welcomed into the Yungo clan through my relationship with Dame Balibor. Uh, he came to me very disturbed. He'd been to Rocky Bay, which was just south of uh, Yakala, and uh, he uh, said to me that there'd been marker boys placed in the Rocky Bay area, and he was disturbed. He wanted to know what it was all about. I couldn't tell him, but uh, we reported to the uh, uh, to Reverend Edgar Wells to what was it, it had occurred. <coughs> Sometime later. Edgar did report to us all that we were going to be visited by two parliamentarians. They were members of the Labor Party, then in opposition. They were Mr Kim Beasley Senior and Mr Gordon Bryant. I believe that Edgar had connected, uh, contacted these members of parliament to discuss the situation with the mining, about the mining operations. Now, I, I fully agreed with this because I could see I'd, I'd been brought up by my father to believe in using uh, parliamentarians to work for the benefit of the community. And so I was supportive. But we didn't, weren't given much of an opportunity to be involved because Edgar was doing things his own way. On one occasion, whilst they were there, uh, Bryant and Beasley dropped into the school and they told me about the... Uh, the idea of the petition which they put up to the young law. And they had suggested to the uh, uh, elders that they petition the par parliament with their grievances. And they said very little. I want to emphasise this. They said very little to me uh, because they wanted... It was evident that the parliamentarians wanted the young law to do their own thing. And I want to emphasise that. In 1982, the Reverend Edgar Wells in his Australian Institute of Aboriginal Studies publication, Reward and Punishment in Arnhem Land, 1962 to 63, indicates how he saw that which took place following the Beasley Bryant visit. A small group of Aborigines struggled valiantly with the wording of the petition to ma match the suggested outline as proposed by the two parliamentarians. And one afternoon waylaid the schoolmaster, me, for assistance with one of two difficult expressions. He was not a member of the committee. This is uh, Edgar talking about me. He was not a member of the committee, but he gave the assistance sought. In the meantime, senior artists were at work on the bark boards in the centre of which the petition was to be glued. 
It had been assumed that all the work could be done by the Aborigines, including the typewriting, which could be done on one Chook's old machine. Now, for this re from this report, I, I make five assumptions, for I had no knowledge of what took place. And I, I was talking to uh, Wally this morning and saying that uh, I'd like to know what happened on the other side because I've never ever known what happened with the Aboriginal people, the Yolngu people. Assumption one, there was a committee of Yolngu who were working on the petition. And no doubt a number of the members were the signatories and possibly also a number of elders. Assumption two, there were no staff members on the committee. Edgar Wells makes the point about me not being on the committee. Now, if any staff member had been on the committee, and that would have included Edgar Wells, there wouldn't have been need to have any assistance from a person like me. Assumption three, the difficult sections relate to the parliamentary wording, which has to be done with any uh, petition to the parliament. It has to be in parliamentary language. And they, they uh, I'll use some of those words in a minute and you can see how difficult it was. And this only became apparent when I saw the format suggested by Beasley and Bryant uh, later. Assumption four, the painting around the edges of the bark has the uh, handprint of Narratin, whom I knew very well, an elder, and was uh, a great friend of mine and we we talked a lot about bark painting. Other elders like him would have been involved according to Edgar Wells. I first saw the edging much later when I witnessed the petition displayed in Parliament House. Assumption five, a significant amount of the Yung Omata must have been written by a member or members of the, of the committee. And I want to emphasize that the Yung Omata was certainly written by members of the committee, that which Dame Bellabur later brought to us. And also there were difficult phrases that needed attention for translation. And that is indicated that the petition was the work of the Yungo, and I want to again emphasise that. My only contact at Jerakala with the petition took place when Dame Bellabur approached me for some assistance with translating the parliamentary wording. And he wanted that to be translated into Yungamata. And I had a look at it, and I knew that I would not be able to help him at those points. Words like, the humble petition of, and the, they humbly pray that the Honourable the House of Representatives, and your petitioners are bound. And they were the words that Don Butler was, was struggling with. And it was beyond me to put that into Yungamata. I did speak some rubbish, didn't I? Uh, at, uh, they never laughed at me, I don't think. They put up with me, my Yungamata. But uh, uh, I knew that I couldn't help him, so I suggested that he might see, talk to Margaret, my wife, who was a better linguist than I was. And she'd uh, given her much more time to studying it. I had to put up with... Uh, Go <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>, well. <coughs> and so Dame Balbo approached Margaret. And it is best that Margaret tells in her own words the manner in which she assisted Dame Balbo <coughs> in his work in the production of the Akala Bark petition. I say this for Margaret has been accused of translating by petition. She didn't. This is what she says. When Dame Balabu asked for my help with the translation of the petition into Yungamata, we talked at length and in plain English about the meaning of each point in the parliamentary wording. He was then able to express it in his opinion. Express it, but I've gone over too many pages. In Yungamata, but writing it in language presented a problem. The translation of the language, this is 50 years ago, don't forget that, it's 50 years ago. The translation of the language into the written form had only recently 
been undertaken through the work of Beal Alo, a Mill and Gimby missionary. Because there were so many clan languages in the area, the lingua franca was Kopawingo, a language similar to Gamoich. This was the form that the Yungor and mission staff were learning at that time. They were learning to write it. My involvement was simply guiding him and correcting spelling where necessary. Where necessary. Note those point, that point. The completed translation was his work and with my limited knowledge I believe it to be as true a translation of the rights and requests of the Yungo as was possible. The process took more than one uh, se series, session, although the exact number I cannot recall. Now many individuals have written their story about putting together uh, the uh, Yerkala Bark petition. As I've mentioned earlier, I think Bain Atwood's uh, ex uh, um, story is worth reading. I'll leave that bit out. I mentioned that some of the stories have been uh, told about the writing of the Bark Petition, and I believe that there have been deleterious remarks made about the young off. And we, I stand here today, I don't stand, I'm sitting, uh, I'm sitting, uh, wanting to state very clear, clearly that the Bark Petition, in my opinion, was made up, was put together by the Yunga of the uh, Yerkala area and was produced by them without the... There was certainly some assistance, as I said, from Margaret and uh, no doubt from the parliamentarians. But the work of the Yerkala Bark Petition was the work of the Yunga of Yerkala. Main, Mike. Very good man. Hallelujah. <laughs> Even if he did throw stones at you. <laughs> Thank you, Ron Crossford. That was well spoken. Um, next guest uh, speaker is uh, Andy Professor Nancy. many obligations to the people of this area, to the young families, the clans with whom I have been welcomed, very generously assisted in understanding some of the things about their society and their culture. And so it's, of course, I'm duty bound and very pleased to acknowledge my appreciation and my respect for their knowledge. And uh, I hope I can do them justice. Well, the story of the Bark Petitions has been told, as uh, Ron Croxford just said, by a number of people. One of them, among them, was Anne Wells, who was Edgar Wells' wife. And she uh, apparently told, well, she tells the story of the painting of the church panels, which does relate to the Bark Petition. Because as she tells the story, in 1962, throughout the end of 1962, the uh, leaders of the clans were asked to paint panels which were to be installed in the church, the new church, which has just been built. And so they did. They spent a great deal of time, and this is her story of the interpretations that she was given by the people who painted those church panels. Those of you who visit Yerkala should certainly take the opportunity to go to Bukalanga and you can see them because they were relegated uh, by later less enlightened uh, missionary superintendents uh, to the underneath the church itself and might have been 
and I don't remember exactly who rescued them, but they were rescued and they are still available to be seen. And in 1962, th when they were finished painting, or by February of 1963, they were actually installed in the, in the new church. And she has a picture uh, in her book of the panels before she says they were had the proper framing. But there was the uh, panel that was painted by the Dua leaders, which is on the left, the uh, Dua leaders on the left, and the Yiddish leaders on the right. Now she also says that the uh, members of the Parliamentary Select Committee who responded to the Bark petition uh, actually visited the church and saw the, the church panels, as they came to be called, and were very much impressed by them. So I think this, this really does all sort of be a, a part of the, of the piece. So uh, they were prepared, I guess, to understand a little bit about the significance of the painting, at least, around the, the panels uh, when, they, when the petition actually appeared. Now, I want to speak a little bit uh, about the, uh, the response to the, the panels in Parliament, although I also would recommend that you, you open the, the IATSIS website and find the story that appears there, because I think, in, in, as my understanding, that's probably the most accurate account of the events both preceding and following the production and the reception of the uh, Bark petition. Now, I want to say a few other things about my relationship with people there in relation to these issues. Uh, but first of all, I want to say that the Yolnu, who felt that they had been so successful in getting a response from the parliament in the presence of the select committee to hear their grievances, that when the issue arose about what this new mining town, we skipped forward a few years, was to be called Gove, they were not very happy. They, in fact, they were very unhappy. And so uh, I would assume that because they regarded their, that their production of the Bark petition had been so successful in terms of government's response, that they should send a petition to Parliament explaining why the name of Nulenbui should be kept rather than Gove, which was being proposed. Now, I in fact have written that story. It's in a chapter called This Place Always ha This Already Place Already Has a Name, which was a phrase I heard from Dave Balipu many times when he saw these new signs appearing around Gove Peninsula. But this place already has a name. So that's the title of the chapter in which I retold the story with uh, a linguist, Melanie Wilkinson, and my late gato, uh, Dr. Muniger, uh, Dr. Uh, Marika. Now, they were successful, uh, although they set, sent their petition uh, to Parliament in 1968. It wasn't until 1969 with a lot of, a lot of, it was a very complicated process of, 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 of uh, debate and argument that went back and forth between people who might be involved in, in effectively making the decision before it was actually uh, officially s decided in 1969 that the, uh, the name Nulenbui would be the official name of the town, not Gove. It always sort of amused me that they even in, uh, envisaged the possibility of naming it for Gove. There was a flight lieutenant named Gove who uh, was based at the, at the uh, uh, the airstrip on the Gove Peninsula. And uh, he must not have been a very good navigator because uh, uh, he was involved in a crash with another, another aircraft plane and died as a result of the crash. But anyway, that was to be the name of, uh, of the town until the Yongu interceded and said, no, this place already has a name, and they were successful. Now, I, will re uh, I didn't arrive in Yerkala. I wasn't there, of course, at the time Ron Croxford was there, nor at the time Ted Egan was there. But in 1969, when I arrived at Yerkala, the leaders were absolutely preoccupied. In fact, the whole community was preoccupied in preparing for their land rights case. And it was those leaders who took me in hand and said, you can help us by writing some things in English. So they used to say, so the court will understand so the government will understand. And so that's how I came to understand their system of land tenure. Now, to say something about those, those uh, leaders, uh, one of the responses, in fact, by, uh, in Parliament, uh, 
was that these signatory, the signatories of the Bark Petition weren't really representative of the clan leaders. They were young, they were inexperienced, they did not have the authority to speak as, as, as representing the interests of the people in these matters. So as a result of that, uh, the uh, Yolngu leaders got together and they said, well, if they don't think we know, we'll, we'll, we'll try another means. We will affix our, our thumbprints, they, this was the way it was done then, for people who hadn't learned how to write in English, uh, and so there were 35 petition, uh, 35 thumbprints which were s signed with an X and witnessed by a Yongu, with one exception, one of the missionaries did actually witness one of the, the uh, thumbprints. But these are the names of men and women who were in fact important leaders, many of whom, most of whom were still alive when I arrived in 1969 and were still active in, in the leading their people. There was Butia, there was Bakic, there was Mawalan, there was Waichwaich, there was Mulayal, there was Miniki, there was Mangiri, there was Karada, there was Gamal, there was Yangarin, there was Dula, there was Mungarawi, there was Balun, there was Yama, there was Jucha Jucha, there was Liawulumu, there was Mithili, there was Bunungu, there was Nerichin, there was Larchanga, Nanyan, Mao, Birikichi, Waichung, Jimbun, Makurungu, Milindir, Minmin, Wilitnga, and Lapa Lapa. And those, you can see again on the, on the ASIS website, you'll see the, the reproduction of that, of those thumbprints with those signatures and witnesses. Now, they were, the reason that they didn't appear and were presented to Parliament was because they didn't have the formal parliamentary language which was necessary in order for a petition to be uh, presented to Parliament. But they do exist and, and you can see copies of them. What I guess, in addition, I want to say about their, <laughs> their leadership was that they were so determined that the government should recognize their system of land tenure that they worked very, very hard to present the evidence in the court. And it was to my uh, absolute utter astonishment it read, to read the, the uh, decision, the uh, finding of Judge Blackburn, who in ringing tones said in his judgment that the evidence presented before him had shown a system of law which was suitable, sophisticated, and served the people of the area whom it governed very, very well. He ended by saying, if ever there was a system of law free from the vagaries of human interference, it is in the evidence that I see before me. I thought, wow, that is the first time, I think, in the history of Australia that Aboriginal people, any group, was acknowledged to have a system of law. He went on, however, to say a few paragraphs later, it was a system of law, however, that did not provide for recognition of proprietary interest in land, which I found totally, totally a non sequitur, totally un without basis, totally without understanding. But it resulted ultimately, of course, in the, when Whitlam was elected, the, the appointment of the man who'd been the leading barrister for the Yolngu in this case, uh, to do a parliament, to a, 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 an, an investigation, an inquiry, and that was became then the, the basis for the uh, the first land rights act, the Northern Territory Land Rights Act. So that did have that kind of outcome. Uh, my brother Roy, who was the effective political leader of the community at the time, never accepted the fact that they hadn't won that case. But nevertheless, I think there's some justification <laughs> in seeing the connection between the evidence that they presented and the people who were involved in the eventual passage of this first Land Rights Act. Thank you. Thank you, Gordy. Nancy Williams. Um, our next speaker is uh, Mr. Ted Egan. Please welcome Ted Egan. <laughs> Namere bookmark. 
Naranja worki Maranga Matna, Moringarapolo Nakana, Nangala, Natalingo Murna, Donamirangona, Walala, Tiala, Katura. At which point you're probably all saying Niyakamangi. And uh, so I'm, uh, I would like to ex extend my tribute to the people of this region in, in their language, uh, an honest effort, I hope. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, I wasn't here in when the Bach petition was uh, was drawn up and signed and, and forwarded, but I arrived here in 1966 and uh, was something of a hostile witness to the development of the uh, the court the Yolngu case for the for the uh, eventual uh, court. And uh, I was working for Northern Territory Administration and. Uh, uh, my government bosses were taking the line, it's Crown land, we'll look after the Aboriginal people, but it's Crown land and uh, we'll permit the mining and we'll, there'll be some royalties payable into the Abri Aboriginal Benefits Trust Fund. Uh, I, very early in the piece, was just so impressed by the, the dignity and the generosity and the understanding of people like Gullaroy's father and uh, uh, that I swung round totally to the notion that of course it's their land and the sooner we uh, recognise this the better. And I eventually uh, transferred, I left my department uh, and uh, fortunately uh, the redoubtable Australian Dr Nugget Coombs uh, who had visited here several times and was, uh, I, all I was hearing were compatible ideas from him and he set up a position of research officer to reporting direct to him which I did for the next five years and uh, so I was involved heavily in the eventualities of the Yukala court case but this time on the side of the Yungu and also the Gurindji campaign which ran uh, which ran uh, con uh, concurrently with the uh, the Yungu Mata, uh, sorry the Yungu uh, uh, appearance in the in the high court um, it's uh, along the way uh, Galaroy emerged as the uh, the uh, very valuable interpreter for all the proceedings building up to the court. And uh, he and I, uh, I was a very good friend of his dad and uh, uh, Galleroy was a fine singer and I eventually recorded, a, wrote a couple of songs called the tri one, The Tribal Land, and the other one called Gurindji Blues and Galleroy recorded them and uh, it's not widely known but the proceeds from the sale of that record uh, financed the Aboriginal Tent Embassy for its first six months, so it's good to have been around. <laughs> And uh, it's, I, I, I'm just so, so uh, happy that I've had these wonderful connections in my life and uh, I wish that every Australian could have had the same opportunities. He was this young smartass from Melbourne who thought he knew everything but suddenly found he didn't know much about Australia at all. But um, I'm, I'm moved to reflect on where we've come from that time. And yesterday I saw the empowerment panel here and it was so impressive. And I've never heard the sentiments expressed more eloquently in English. But I have heard the same expressions of hope uh, exp uh, given for the last 50 years, time and time and time again. And I wondered yesterday whether I was watching uh, a presentation of the Gama Festival 50 years hence when a group of people would be still scratching their heads and saying, how in the hell are we going to get empowerment? And I would love to see a combination of those two groups, the, the, uh, the descendants of the original Bach petitioners and the, the very articulate, wonderfully experienced people from other regions, many of whom have, have lost their, their land battles over the years. But there is, there is hope that, that one or two, I think there are three groups in the Northern Territory who could be the, the basis whereby a level of autonomy could be established uh, where government is just not in the act anymore. Government's there and uh, these would be Australian people uh, supporting the notion of a national government, but people totally autonomous in their own region. And it only comes when you get, when you get financial empowerment. And I would, I would suggest that there's good mileage in going to those three communities, the Wildbury, the Tiwi and the, the people who call themselves Yungu, whose land is now owned by them on an inalienable basis. It's, it's, you can draw it on a map and you can say, that's the land we're talking about. These are the people we're talking about. Set up a, a, a local population register 
of Yolngu and classified Yolngu, uh, friends, you know, people who are married to and so on, and uh, use that population basis as the lever to approach government once off and say, here we are, we live in this defined region, we still speak, as, as uh, Jawa said yesterday, we still speak the language that was spoken here a thousand years ago. We do know what's best for our country and our kids, and um, we ask you to consider a one-off futures payment based on dollar sign times the number of people we have here in recognition of the fact that we have safeguarded this land for so long. And uh, at, the po at the point where you then, where the bodies then set up their investment base and they make their own financial decisions and buy up half of Collins Street in Melbourne and, uh, and put, the, put money in banks in Switzerland and so on, only then will they be empowered properly. And uh, I see uh, it, it was wonderful for me to hear all these eloquent <coughs> ladies and gentlemen of the, of the previous generation saying the same things over and over again. We must be empowered. We must be in control. And it's, a, it's, a, it's very easy, and I'm not putting down government, but it's very easy for, as Delia Laurie said, your next wave of saviours to come in and say, here's some money, uh, uh, but it doesn't resolve the real problems which are all about land and identity. So it's interesting for me to have been around for the 50 years that's transpired and it's a, a marvellous occasion and a marvellous opportunity for real political action at a place like this and it's a very political issue and I hope that the, the, the nation's leaders, most of whom were along the empowerment panel yesterday in, in terms of articulation, uh, combine with the people who still retain language, still retain ceremony, do own their land do see the, what's going to happen in the future, that they get together and give us something better in 50 years' time. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. That was well spoken. Um, Ted, um, Ted speaks so many languages I know the territory. So, don't ever ask questions to him. He might give you a answer back in the language. So, <laughs> thanks. Uh, next speaker is um, Mr. Galawa Unipingo. Please welcome Mr. Unipingo. Uh, my mark. Walala. I am glad that you have all turned up here to, to witness some uh, some stories, uh, and old stories that are uh, being passed, and uh, they are old stories of uh, the land rights. <coughs> it's now 50 years ago that uh, this story has been sitting else on, on somewhere. And uh, the Aboriginal people have practiced the land rights. Land rights with uh, with uh, some rights to their ownership and uh, some rights they haven't um, really received that ownership. I needn't go into that because uh, it's going to be too far long and long way to uh, surrender those stories to together to be able to tell you people, the whole story, 
what, what does it mean? Aboriginal people, including the, the white people, who are, who are telling that story, uh, Baba Croxford, Ka Nancy, Kanjala, Ka Ted, they have uh, told you that story about land rights, but didn't really go on into the land ownership. The land ownership is more, more to it than uh, land rights. Land rights is putting it in general that covers everybody. And land ownership is particularly pointing at you. And uh, you saying, I have a land rights. Good on you. Good on you. Aboriginal people have been saying that all along since the land rights act been passed by the Commonwealth Government. And uh, the Land Right Act has come through the, through the years to that land ownership. And that land ownership was involved mainly the people in the, no the Northern Territory mainly and uh, nowhere else in Australia. And that was good. And that gave the ownership, the land uh, of, the, of the mining company. And the mining company gave uh, the right to Aboriginal people to say yes and no to mining. And now we're talking about the mining. Mining has been uh, developed here, uh, which we are talking about. Mining have, have uh, developed with uh, the land rights that has brought the issue to the, uh, to the conference today. And uh, the land rights have have been the issue of, uh, of uh, you listening to that rights. What is it? What is it that uh, we, we as, as uh, other people wants to know about land rights? We have explained a little bit about ins and outs of uh, land ownership, the nitty gritties of uh, the land ownership, um, and so on. And uh, these people uh, have put those things together a little bit, uh, but not, not all of it. What I'd like to, to say is that the land right is now, has, has been dead. A very dead for a long time. Uh, it hasn't, um, hasn't been uh, land rights to Aboriginal people to breed land. The land that is alive in their heart and in their head. It's been a, a land in their heart and in their head, a land that they have. All right, if that is the case, what is the next? Well, the next thing is we haven't talked about. We haven't really talked about. No politician, no nobody has talked about. Land rights have been talked about to Aboriginal people, Aboriginal people must have the land rights. 
and full stop. But what did it involve? Did it involve the mining? Did it involve the other things? Surrounding uh, the mining, uh, the uh, land rights. Aboriginal people are still the poorest people on earth having land rights. We do have a land, but that land hasn't got anything that is ours. And uh, you're probably asking a question in your own, in your own, right, right out wh while I say that. Why do you ask that question? Aboriginal people do have a land rights, but what else do they have? They have none. They have nothing. Aboriginal people have nothing. All right. We um, I'd like to meet the Prime Minister next, this afternoon. I'd like to tell him that. And I'll tell him that Aboriginal people have land rights, but it has nothing. What else can it be to the Aboriginal people that'll bring in independence to Aboriginal people through land ownership? And that is the question. That is the inside question, ladies and gentlemen. Let's think about land rights. Let's think about land ownership. And let's think about who actually owns it. There is a government of the day that, that normally takes care of uh, those things that, that matters. And uh, those things are, are land that works. The land that works for you, lands that work for him, lands that works for all of us. Land that gives and takes. Lands that gives the richest part of the goodness. Land that makes it happier. And what is it? It is now 50 years that we have talked about the land rights and these gentlemen and Nancy has told you the story how hard it was to struggle about land. Are we to think about the land and land to that stage? or are we to think about the land uh, that, that does the next? What's the next step that the land gives to Aboriginal people? And that is big question, and no, no, no answers to it. 
a big question mark and now answers to it. The answer would have it by somebody. And uh, it would be the next new prime minister, maybe. Maybe the old prime minister, but he's gone worn out. I think all the government and both the government, the both the government that we use, this nation has used, we have worn out the government of answering the question of the Aboriginal people. It is the hardest question of the Aboriginal case. We will tell how many politicians to turn their heads, to turn their ears to the real facts, the real story, the land rights. And land rights must work for Aboriginal people. What way? What way will it make Aboriginal people happier Well, every one of us, every one of you, we have business in your own place. You're happy, you, you're working, you're earning money, you, you're bringing in money, you bank your money, and you see your money, oh, it grows, you grows, it grows. Oh, it grows too big one day. Oh, too big. <coughs> it grows money. And uh, nobody likes it. <coughs> but some, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way of living. It's that the way of living that Aboriginal people wants to. Well, my word, my word, we would like to try that. <laughs> you can laugh. <laughs> it is the very case. The Land Right Act is about land that earns money. We would like to turn the money, uh, turn the land into money, and uh, money makes makes Aboriginal people the happiest. Thank you.